can think of uh, the, the, one of the most boring trips that I've ever been on is driving from New York, I think it was New York, uh, from New York through Nebraska, through actually through Iowa, then Nebraska, on um, Interstate 80, and just seeing miles and miles and miles of wheat, corn, wheat, corn, wheat, corn, for miles and miles and miles. And the highway just sort of straight. Well, that's not true. That's kind of a lie. And you'll find out, you'll find out that I do tell lies from the pulpit. <laughs> because the will tell you that I tell lies occasionally, because it's not straight. It's like this. And it's going up and down, up and down. And if I didn't have my wife with me, it would be lulling me to sleep. Lulling me to sleep. You know, it wouldn't be a good, very safe drive for me. And um, then I stopped to think, and I thought about that boring drive this week. I stopped to think that, that a lot of work went into preparing that ground because somebody had to, to, to dig up all that dirt. They don't use shovels. They use tractors and large tractors, and they go through and roll that dirt over. And then someone has to come through with a, a planter and plant all the seed that would eventually turn into wheat and corn. And then it would be a few years, a few months later, someone has to go through with some kind of... Uh, a harvester and have all that corn plucked and turned into canned corn and turned into uh, corn on the cob and turned into cornbread and corn flour and all the things, uh, corn flakes in the morning we eat and you know, all the work. It may be a boring drive, but without it, uh, we'd be nowhere. Uh, that whole process of making corn, making wheat, is something that Paul talks about as we come to the last chapter, our last, our last study of the book of Galatians. Uh, we have, through the last uh, few weeks, uh, been making our way through uh, parts of the book of Galatians. This is the last study that we'll be doing with that. And, uh, but uh, uh, turn with me, if you will, turn just a couple of minutes to Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 through 10. Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 through 10. Do not be deceived, Paul writes. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. The one who sows to please his sinful nature, from that nature will reap destruction. The one who sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary and doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Um, I think it's interesting that the, the same God who, who makes physical laws is the same God who gives us a set of moral laws. Now, we have no problem um, uh, with physical laws. If I take my hymnal, and if I, if I throw this up in the air, Bob, what's going to happen? <coughs> Not you, but if I just throw it up in the air, what's going to happen? I would come down again. It could probably come down again. We know that because the physical laws are always there. Bob, would you, this is the Bob, would you go over and do me a favor mm -hmm. and go turn off, turn this light switch that's over here closest to me off. And, and just before you do, what's going to happen when he flicks that switch? Pardon? The light. The light will go off. Let's see if it works. Ooh, lights went off. And turn it back on again. You know, how'd you know it was going to work? Pardon? Yeah, faith is going to work. We, apparently, we certainly put a great deal of faith in the, the physical laws that govern light switches, electricity, and the physics of objects going up have to come down. Um, there was a, a time not too long ago when I, I think most of you heard part of this story, but 
but I and my pastor friend from Spencerport Wesleyan, we, we went out to the Red Wings game, and we got there early enough, and we got lunch, and we got, uh, what did we get? We, get, we got hot dogs or something, and uh, french fries, and we went to our seats and watched them prepare the field, and they put a lot of effort into getting that, 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 that surface around Frontier Field nice and smooth, and, and putting down the white stripes so it was nice and bright against the, and, and, and then we sat got ready for the game to start. We watched them announce the, the guests for the day, and, and they saw the first pitches come out, and then we watched the first, the first half of an inning. At the end of the first half of the inning, I saw three men gathering right down in front of the, the, the home team's uh, dugout, and those three men were sort of talking. One of them uh, was Dan, and he was pointing to the sky, and the other was, was the, the chief of the grounds crew, and the other was the head umpire, and they were just sort of talking and, and saying what they were going to do, but something about something. It wasn't really clear. And then all of a sudden, I turned my head over to the right over here, and I saw people just running out of the stadium, literally running down the stairs, they go into the stadium, and uh, I figured that my pastor friend and I, Pastor McClellan and I, probably ought to do the same. And we no sooner got under the cover of the stadium, and the sky just let loose with rain and hail and wind. And though we're under the stadium, covered by the stadium, we're still soaking wet. Enough water has been blown into the under. This isn't a it's not a closed enclosed stadium. It's we're under cover, but there's enough wind coming in through the to the sides that we're still wet. And uh, we stayed there for an hour and a half waiting for them to start the game. They did eventually start the game. The Red Wings did win, but we didn't stay for that. But, you know, how did I know to leave the stadium? The weather was bad. The clouds got dark. And everybody else was running. You know, we have a lot of faith in physical laws. Uh, we have a lot of faith in the things that, that we that we that make up science. Why is it that we, when we have no problem with the God who the same God who created science and the laws that he makes for science, why do we have trouble believing that there are spiritual laws that are just as absolute, just as firm, just as concrete, and just as knowable as there were physical laws? Um, some of you may know the name Michael Faraday, uh, at least by reputation. He was a, a, a famous scientist from back in the 1700s, 1800s, who discovered a lot about electricity. Um, he was uh, a, a leader of his time, a genius when it came to knowing and deciding and teaching us about electricity. And he had perfected or, or contributed to the scientific method. The scientific method says that we, we make a proposal and say, okay, because we know this, we think this is going to happen, let's do an experiment and see if we're right. And either we're not or we are or not. We either proved or disproved our hypothesis. Um, that's because we trust the scientific method. Well, Michael Faraday, this was a great physicist, uh, electri electrician, electri electronics person, um, was dying, and someone asked him, what about all your presumptions? What about all your hypothesis now? You're on your deathbed. What does all that have to do with anything? And he turned to his friend who asked the question, I do not entrust my head to presumptions at this moment, but to certainties. And then he quoted, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I committed to him against that day. Here's a man of faith. He knew science, but he was a man of faith. We have trouble making this connection between physical laws, physical laws that we know are true, and sometimes believing in our culture that there are also moral laws that we need to obey. Today's passage gives us a couple of those moral laws that are appropriate for us to know, appropriate for us to apply. The first law is this. We sow what we have. We sow what we have. I don't know where you spend your time. I don't know what your priorities are. I don't know uh, who you spend your time with. But I know two people who know exactly where you spend your time. I know two people who know exactly what your priorities are. I know two people who know exactly 
who you spend your time with. Those two people are God and yourself. Listen to what Paul says about the priorities that, that we set. The one who sows to please his sinful nature, from that nature will reap destruction. The one who sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. We used to live in Iowa before we moved to New York. And uh, we lived in, up in the north. We think of Iowa as sort of a big, somewhat of a rectangular state, not exactly, has a couple of humps. But we lived up in the northwest corner of Iowa. And the northwest, cor northwest corner of Iowa is hog country. Stinky, smelly hog country. Remember that, Sandra? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Now, if you live in hog country, you don't plant hogs. If you're a hog farmer, you don't put hogs in the ground. If you live in hog country, you plant corn to be used as feed. And so the hog farmer has lots and lots of land, not so much because of the pigs that he owns, but they grow the corn that he has to use to feed them. And so at the beginning of the spring, he'll go out to the seed salesman and he'll buy himself bags and bags and bags of corn to plant in the ground. And when he, that's what he has. He has corn to plant. He's bought it. He wants to get it to the ground. Once the weather clears up in uh, late April, early May, he'll start going around and planting that corn for, for, so he can feed the hogs later on in the winter, or the, the, pardon me, later on in the summer and into the fall. He doesn't, because he has corn seed, he doesn't plant pumpkin seed. He doesn't plant watermelon seed. He plants what he has. You know, the same is true in our spiritual life. We plant what we have. Jesus put it this way in Mark 7. From, for from within, out of men's hearts, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and make a man unclean. They are the seed that we plant if we plant from the, from, from the world. We plant from uh, this sinful nature. These are the things that we plant. Well, we have another kind of seed. We don't have to plant that kind of seed. We talked about that last week. We talked about the kind of seed that comes from living a spiritual life. We love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. What kind of seed are we planting? What kind of seed is coming into your life? Are you spending your time investing in it? Are you spending your time putting it into the ground that can come out of your life? We sow what we have. The second principle that, that Paul gives us here is this. We reap what we sow. Um, go back to the corn. If I'm a, 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 a hog farmer, I planted corn, and it comes to be uh, July 1st, and it gets to be middle of, uh, uh, close to the Independence Day, I don't expect to go out and find in my cornfield watermelon. I didn't plant watermelon seed, I planted corn seed. I'll reap what I sow. It gets to be fall, and I planted corn seed, but I go out and check my field, and I look around, and all I see are these big orange things. I've got pumpkins. No, I don't have pumpkins. I have corn stalks growing in my cornfield. That's what I planted. I will reap what I sow. Um, Paul says the same principle applies to our spiritual lives. There's a direct connection between what we, what we sow and what we reap. Where we spend our time and what we get out of it. Who we spend our time with and what we get out of it. Where we spend our priorities and what we get out of it. James Nancaville gave a list of 25. and I, I intended to bring all 25. I wasn't going to read all 25. I meant to bring all 25. I forgot to bring the whole list. But let me read four or five of these. I thought they were good. So bad habits. Pardon, these are things you cannot do. Given this principle, these are things that James Nacadell says we can't do. We can't sow bad habits and expect to reap a good character. We can't sow wicked thoughts and reap a clean life. We can't sow dishonesty and reap integrity. We can't sow 
disrespect and expect to reap respect. We can't sow cowardice and expect to reap courage. We can't sow the neglect of the Lord's house and expect to reap strength and temptation. We can't sow neglect of the Bible and reap a well-guided life. We can't sow human thistles and reap human roses. Um, that's just a few, that's not all of them. I didn't put all of them in the sermon. I didn't read all of them that I had here, so you'd be grateful I haven't got the whole list. But we can turn that around. These aren't James. These aren't James and Ectabills. These are mine. He says here, I, I, I suggested some, some of my own. If we sow love, we can expect to reap love. If we sow grace, we can expect to reap grace. If we sow peace, we can expect to reap peace. If we sow thankfulness, we can expect to reap thankfulness. Now, that may, none of that scripture, of course, those are all James Nankabills and Floyd Johnson's interpretation. But on the other hand, they sound an awful lot like Paul's words. Let us not become weary in good deed. This is one of these words from the passage today. Let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. I think it's interesting. God promises to walk with us. God promises us to... to, to uh, be with us, guide us, and direct us. People listen to him. If we plant the things that come from a spiritual life, he will allow those things to grow into our own lives. So the question really comes, what do I want to read? What do I want from God? And I guess the question is turned on, what, what do I want? And what do you want? What do you want to read? Because what we read is what we sow. Precious God, we ask that you would take this, that you would allow us during this week to find opportunities to sow <coughs> from our spiritual side. That you give us opportunities to sow uh, from our spiritual lives. That we might reap the things that come from you. We ask that you give us the ability to put aside those things that keep us from walking with you, that keep us from uh, serving you, and that, that force us to reap things that are not from you. Let us turn to you, to Christ.